This is the OTB Television Network, a service of Capital District Off-Track Betting. The announcement brand new show here on Capital OTB TV. Happy to have you on board for a Volume 1, Edition 1. The, the byword here is fast paced news, commentary, opinion, guests, handicapping, and more. I'm Seth Merrill, in with Anthony Mormino. Good morning, Anthony. Good morning, Seth. Happy to uh, launch the uh -huh. new program, and we are off and running. The gates are open, and we're off, and we're going to kick things right off with a guest here at the top of the show. Uh, there was a, an issue uh, the holiday uh, this past Monday at Aqueduct, a funny kind of an objection that was called, uh, and I just wanted to kind of get the background on jockeys and what the situation is, and I thought, who better to reach out to than Rich Migliori from the New York Racing Association. Rich, good morning. Guest one on the new show. Well, thanks. Good morning and uh, Happy New Year. Honored to be the, the first guest. That's right. We're happy to have you on board. And, and Rich, we're going back to uh, Monday at race number two. And as they came onto the wire, uh, Travis Stone said, oh, there's been a, 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 an objection. Number four is claiming against the winner, number three. And I think all of us in the, the audience scratched our head because we're going to watch the race here and folks can watch the chicklets. The three and the four are never close, much less in the stretch. Now, as we watch the race and they get towards the far turn, coming out of the turn, the four might have been a little bit tight with another horse. It's clearly not the three. But before we get into the specifics and, and how apprentices learn that, I just want to talk specifically about this race. Did we ever find out that the giant, and it's uh, the apprentice Kevin Mendes, did he just get the wrong license plate, so called? Yeah, he got the wrong license plate number. Um, you know, and, and honestly, even the horse that he intended to do, yeah, like, actually, it wasn't much. Yeah, that wasn't going to be a either. No, but yeah, that being said, um, he's a young kid that he got to use to uh, speed the race, I think, one time to really see the race. Um, I mean, I can't really uh, call him now, obviously. <laughs> but, um, uh, you, you know, I, like when I started riding, you, the first ride is like a, the gates open, there's a lot of yelling and dirt flying and a blur of colors and you don't know what happened. And then after you ride 100, you start to see it, literally ride 1,000, you really see it. By the time you ride 10,000, it's in slow motion. But, um, you know, he's a young kid that uh, just uh, not seeing the race as well as you would like him to. And that's what I wanted to talk about, because frankly, until this situation, and again, this, this is a seven-pound apprentice, so brand new at the game. And I'd never really thought about it before. Obviously, when, the, when kids go out and they're the 10-pound, the 7-pound apprentice, the first rides, as you say, and whatnot, you're learning the mechanics of riding. You're learning how do you get your horse in the gate, how do you handle a horse in the gate, how do you get him out, and then, for lack of a better word, the etiquette of riding in a race. But I'd never thought about it. But you also have to know the nuts and bolts of what happens if you get interfered with. What's the mentoring process there? How do these kids learn that? Well, no, they're, they're informed in the jockey's room by the clerk of scales and by the stewards that if they you know, need to claim foul, that they claim foul at the outrider that's stationed past the finish wire. Um, so they, they, you know, they're well-schooled as to how to do that and, and you know, who to talk to. Um, you know, years ago, we didn't have the quick official, so you had an opportunity to come back and speak with your owner or trainer, and, you know, which I actually like the quick official because sometimes you knew there was nothing to claim foul about and the owner and trainer would see it different from the stands and then you, you know, feel silly, you know, lodging what you knew was a frivolous claim of foul, but you had to because your connections wanted to. But, um, you know, every Sunday morning I have uh, the apprentices uh, at 11 o'clock. We do the apprentice program. I'm, I was actually preparing for it in my office uh, waiting for you guys to call. And, um, you know, this year we have a little bit, greener or a little bit less experienced uh, apprentices than we've had in the past. Um, more seven-pound apprentices, more ten-pound apprentices. We don't have that kind of established five-pound apprentice who is on the cusp of becoming a journeyman. So this year it's just a little bit different. Um, a lot more to talk about. I think I have eight races on my list today. But, um, you know, it, it, it's always fun for me and interesting to see them develop. I mean, I had uh, Irad and Jose Ortiz and Manny Franco in, in the program and 
you know, obviously they were very good, polished riders starting out, but, you know, you'd like to think you had a little hand in helping mentor them along. Yeah, I, I have a quick question. Now, does the does young Mr. Mendes, does he get razzed by that, or do the jockeys get upset with him? I think this one probably <laughs> you get ragged on a little bit yeah. about this one. I mean, um, yeah, because this, this one was so ridiculous, <laughs> really. And I have one on Friday uh, the, the other day when we returned to racing, and it, it's, 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 it's different because Aaron Grider, I'm not only that, it got upheld, so, you know, uh, in the sixth race on Friday, Aaron Ryder, uh, you know, claimed foul against Storm Pursuit for something that happened early in the back. My only thing was, because uh, obviously uh, we have the quick officials, but you could even tell in John Embryal's voice how late uh, the public was made aware uh, in John's voice. He was basically saying, whoa, hold on here. We have a late foul of claim. Uh, did something go wrong in the communication uh, in that race or... Oh, what happened? Because I got to tell you, I, we watch a lot of races, and I, I looked up from my notes. I go, claim a foul now? I was waiting for John to give me the official prices. Yeah, you know what happened with that was that um, Aaron Torse did not gallop out at all. He, he pulled up within 100 yards of the finish line. Okay. So he never made it all the way <laughs> to the outrider to claim foul. So he wanted to claim foul, so what he had to do was jog back quickly, and he was hollering down to the Kirk of Scales from the horse's back. So that's why... Um, it, it took that long. Usually horses gallop out at least an eighth of a mile. That horse pulled up very abruptly on his own. But, uh, you, you know, I, I think there was, like, mixed uh, uh, feelings about that disqualification. Right. And I, I think Aaron was more mad that, hey, you know what, you can go straight a little bit before you got to come over and take my ground. And he was on a horse regulus that if you get it in his mouth, he really tries to bear out. Okay. And Aaron had to steady him, and then he's trying to get out the rest of the way. But, you know, if they call that all the time, I'm all for it, and, and I think that it'll make guys straighten their horses up more out of the gate. This nonsense that horses can't be controlled leaving the gate is just that, nonsense. Now, I'm not saying the first step a horse steers hard one way or the other, but you know and you can see visibly when a rider breaks his hands off a horse's neck and he's pulling and trying to correct the horse, whether they're making an effort or not. But it's become such an accepted practice in North American racing that, hey, if the horse breaks, well, it's the gate, and you don't have to correct him. Well, that's lent itself to a lot of rough riding out of the gate. And to me, the start is maybe the most important part of any race because it establishes what kind of position and how the race is going to be run right off the bat. And I think if you crack down, you'd be surprised how much more control guys will have out of the gate. And Seth, you brought up a good, good point about young jockeys and learning how to break from the gate, how to handle their horses in the gate. In this day and age... Almost every horse gets a handler in the gate, and I think that doesn't do young riders a favor because they don't have to learn how to really square a horse up and get him balanced on their own. So the assistant starter can only have a horse's head straight. He can't tell you what that horse's legs are doing. That's up to the jockey to say, hey, wait, 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 i got to move him. His left hind is, is too far back or is, is too far forward, and he's going to break sloppily. And I think it's lent itself to a lot of rougher starts because guys don't get the same education on how to handle horses alone in the starting gate and to really feel their horse underneath them. Well, talk a little bit about, is that some of the, some of the things you get into in your apprentice uh, mentoring program? And talk a little bit about that. What do you do with these apprentices on a weekly basis? Yeah, I mean, we, we um, definitely go over that kind of stuff. I actually get on an equisizer. That, that's kind of fun to watch me now. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, broken down old jockey on the equisizer, but uh, just trying to explain to them and show them you know, the proper way to handle a horse in the gate and square them up and, you know, um, and even the hold on their reins leaving the gate. You don't want it too loose where they can go any direction. You can't have it too tight because then they're going to break slow or you're going to be in, in their mouth and inhibit their first stride. Um, so we definitely go over that stuff, the kind of physical mechanics of it. We go over race replays and things that, uh, you know, uh, Hector Diaz, who I think is, a, is very talented and is going to have a future. Um, he's a 10-pound apprentice that just has two wins so far. But he ran up in a, in a spot going to the turn where he's three-quarters of a length um, or just a quarter of a length in there, three-quarters of a length out of there. And that does not constitute ownership of that spot. The, the, the jockey on the lead is always going to come off the rail a little bit to give his, himself and his horse room to switch leads and drop to the rail. So just because you get your horse's head in there doesn't mean you belong there. And, and he did that recently. And... He was lucky with Antonio Gallardo, who 
you know, it was kind of a, a, a polished older rider who didn't just shut the door on him, but went forward and let him know you're going to have to get out of there because you don't own that spot. And that's like jockey 101. That's stuff that, you know, a lot of people maybe don't realize, but uh, either you got to be all the way in there or all the way out of there. You can't linger in that in-between no-man's-land zone. So we, we go over that kind of stuff. Um, certainly if I see them make mistakes, I save it for Sundays and I pull up the film. But if I see an egregious mistake or something very dangerous, I go right from my office down to the jockey's room. I take them immediately to the replay center. I should be like, if it's something that can't wait till Sunday. Then um, other things as well. Um, next week we'll have uh, Jesse Glacius, who's an owner but a financial advisor, a financial planner. Oh, nice. Come in and, yeah, and come in and talk to them about saving their money, paying their taxes. They don't have to pick up everybody's check when they're winning races. And, you know, how, how quickly your friends disappear when you're not winning <laughs> races, that kind of thing. Um, a nutritionalist, we have a nutritionalist come and talk about food, and as a jockey, obviously having to make weight all the time, you have to approach food as fuel. You can't look at food like uh, an average person, you know, you go out, you socialize, you hang out with friends, you eat, you drink. No, whatever you're putting in your body has to have a purpose and, and give you the energy you need to do this job and the clarity of mind. And So we have a nutritionalist, we have people from the media department here in Naira come down and talk to them how to deal with the media, how to speak to people. Um, uh, if they don't know English, I've sent kids for English lessons because it's you know, a game you have to communicate to owners and trainers. So we try not to just cover riding, but every other facet of it that they're going to face as young kids that, um, you know, you want them prepared for life as well as, as riding. Nice. Sounds uh, like a comprehensive program and a, a, a worthwhile program as well. Rich, I uh, appreciate the visit. Again, wanted to just get a little background on, you know, when a, a, an apprentice, a kid is getting new to the game, I, that situation on Monday, how that's handled. And uh, it's nice to know there's that program down there that, as I say, far more comprehensive than I even knew about. Appreciate the conversation this morning. We'll talk again. Guys, great to talk to you. Talk to you All soon. Right. Rich Migliori from the New York Racing Association. A uh, couple yeah. quick things about, yeah. the, about the Aaron Grider disqualification. Richard ha has uh, duties this morning that just talked about. Uh, he said there was kind of some hubbub whether it should have come down or not. We've had these discussions before. I don't know if you have an opinion on race. But what, what confirmed that I think now everybody's going to fall off their chair, that I think the stewards got it right, how's this, Seth? When they allowed the DQ... They didn't put the horse directly behind the jockey who claimed foul, who was Aaron Grider. Angel Arroyo did not claim foul, which he should have. I give the stewards kudos here because they did the most right thing, protecting the better here, so everybody make sure this is on their the DVR tape, that they put Storm Pursuit fifth. And I really would like then, and I've talked about this, and I'd like to have Richard on one time, maybe where the lack, the, the phone call conversation that I said. It's like, I really now want to ask Angel Arroyo, like, I'd be like, listen, buddy, the stewards just saved your bacon because you're now part of the superfecta. You didn't claim foul. I thought it was, and Seth, I have to tell you something, and I don't look at every race. I could not think of the last time because the rules are, if they uphold your uh, claim of foul, you have to go directly behind the horse you fouled. But he went directly behind, not the horse he claimed foul behind. I could not, and it would have been a long conversation with Richard uh, well, we to got, go we, in. We got, we got a head-on of the LeCompte coming up where I think, well, that, I think he should have claimed foul. How about the head-on of the Pasco that we're going to uh, see? I was going to send Richard off with, uh, to watch that because uh, that was, that was as, as egregious as yeah, I could there, see. But there, there are situations where... So kudos to the stewards. They put yeah. it behind... Uh, and, 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 and I agree with Rich. Uh, they let too much go on out of the gate. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, that, that has become just... I like Rich Jet, a shrug of the Central. shoulders. Oh, it's the, it's coming out of the gate. All right, before we go to the break, just uh, some quick thoughts on the Eclipse Awards last night. I, I don't know whether there's a whole lot to talk about because no. we talked to, uh, with Dick Powell earlier on the handicapper support. Uh, to put it in racing terms, it was a chalky night. There was yes. no surprises. There was three uh, winners that were unanimous. Um, I don't think there was anything surprising uh, no. given their now, California thing, Chrome Horse of the, the Year. I think the thing that I uh, didn't I make Arrogate plus two hundred. D uh, and for, for the real champion. Yeah, and, and he, he just would slaughter the whole three-year-old. Yeah, and the, the final vote there, two forty-three, <laughs> exaggerator two. 
Nyquist two, Gunrunner one. Um, and I think in the old days that would be very surprising. You basically put in a two race campaign that starts on August 25th and you, you sweep, a, you basically backhand the Triple Crown. And that was kind of, uh, as I say, there were three unanimous and really there was no other category. I think the closest. Well, we know who voted for Songbird for Philly and Mary Sprinter. <laughs> yeah, our friend John Preachy, uh, he was a little bit, he was the outlier there. Uh, uh, mine in the, uh, the two year old Philly, Pretty City Dancer. I, luckily, there was four other people who joined. I, I would not want to look down and see one that was. My, I would not have that, that problem. Was, but I will say my this. Vote. I will say this, and it's and and trust me when I tell you and Brian Edo and Future Seth, I loved Champagne Room at thirty-three to one. He could not believe how calm I was when she won. But everybody thinks she was a one-horse wonder. Do you think it's at all possible that I could love a horse at thirty-three to one? That there was nothing there. I, I have a pad set. I, I was. T I think she's talented. She I'm just not sure. People are saying she's talented. They got the a campaign. low buyer speed figure, but I'm like, she was. I loved her that day coming out of her. Pre I, I'm just saying she was the slam dunk winner, and people. I'm like, she, she did win by a lot, right? She won oh, by yeah, like it was, plus 100. Yeah, again, it was 202 to 21. Yeah, it did chalk out, but I, you know, just just as a side note. All right, we'll head to a break, and when we come back, uh, we'll take a look at the co Le Compte, give a little handicapping, and uh, much, much more. Stay tuned. Want more rewards? How about this? During the month of January, all Capital Bets account holders earn an additional 2% cash back on combined wagers of $250 or more when wagering on Aqueduct or Gulfstream Park. Not a Capital Bets account holder? Now's your chance to join and earn an additional 2% cash back on combined exotic wagers. Plus, when you join, wager $50 and Capital OTB will deposit $50 in your account. That's $50 free. No points, no gift cards, actual cash from Capital OTB. Championship horse racing continues at Capital OTB. There's no better place to watch, wager, and win than OTB TV and CapitalOTBBet.com. January 28th at Gulfstream Park, an icon takes flight. The world's richest thoroughbred horse race. 12 of the sport's finest horses. One race. $12 million on the line. Watch, wager, witness. Go to PegasusWorldCup.com for more. Not at the track and not near a computer? No problem. Wager with Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System and you'll never get shut out again. Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System is quick, simple to use, and guarantees your wagers are accurate and placed on time. For more information, visit CapitalOTB.com or call Capital OTB's customer service hotline at 800-292-BETS. Capital OTB's Touchstone Wagering System. Never get shut out again. Welcome back to the kickoff edition of And They're Off. Seth Merrill and Anthony Mormino. Uh, take a look now at the Lecomte from yesterday. I always like, like to take a look at these uh, races on the road to the Triple Crown. We are uh, kicking off the Louisiana series. Um, I talked to Brad Cox yesterday. I thought Ark Lowe was very intriguing. Uh, Ark Lowe is going to wind up finishing third, and here the number two horse. You can kind of get a look on the uh, pan fourth? shot that there's some trouble. I think fourth, right? Yeah, did I say, what did I say? Third. Oh, so finished finish fourth finish four as the number two horse uh, at six to one. But you can see he's going to get uh, a little bit of trouble uh, as they come down to the stretch. And I think we're going to have the head on after we see this. Guest Suite is the winner. I was not enamored with Guest Suite that much. And I was, uh, I guess, uh, clueless there. As this, you in the uh, minority. The, yeah, this horse went <laughs> off as a favorite. Uh, and five to one on the morning line went off as a favorite. Betting public right on. I did like Untrapped. I also liked uh, Asmussen's Totality. Totality disappointing. Tenth in the field of 11.
You see that? You see that darkness is all horse. Oh, that's gonna be a workout. How do I know that? Because I haven't seen it in about 30 at that hour of the morning. But I know it's usually dark and not trying to get ahead on. No, no bet on. Him, though, so to look at that, I, I think he gets hurted out. And it was worth at least letting the stewards. I was gonna say ask you because of on the pan. He's like. Was it more than one or two strides? And he, he pushing the, the, the I love head-ons. The, the inside horse moves him out a couple of paths. I'll get to take a look uh, at so it. So it's enough to qualify but as But untrapped would be the one. But then, and then you know, because I will say this. If a horse is spinning the wheels or not making anything after being down inside, saving ground, and it looked like Ricardo Santana had horse, then you spin your wheels, you get double merits. But because it was not an officially muddy-sealed race track. I'll give you, I'll tell you one thing. This is one of the things I started thinking. Said the two or three race press seasons from Kentucky, and get one of them on a like a muddy sealed racetrack. Yeah, you know, less to go on going forward, which I like. And it's been a crazy season as far as that weather too. Yes, but but two major as, racing as we've yeah, next uh, series that you would expect weather's got to even a little bit. All right, uh, handicapping segment now. We'll cut ahead. We can we keep some stats that we uh, go for. What do you want to do? And uh, by, uh, the, uh, our, our drawn. And, 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 that, that I, is, see, I give him credit. We did a dry run here. How little, how much they. Could but I'll give, me in. I'll give you credit. I've done it on show because both had one top. So, yes. so folks would have gotten good information. We did a dry run the other day, and we both had trifectas. You had a, a well, expensive pyramid. We took a horse on top that I also on top a box. I hit. You, you got all the horses yeah. because pyramid. Uh, but again, we both like those that wanting the race. They're probably you know, two one. I mean, it wasn't okay. So folks could have gotten something that. Um, but we'll we'll look at one race. We'll take a look at one race uh, and go head to head, and then choose our own race for a bit of a way for every week. So we've done that. Um, and uh, race of the week this week that it goes. I pick this week. You'll pick next week. Okay. I was like, wow. Yeah, and uh, that's kind of what I found in Diggy. There's nothing I was looking for one that maybe I felt a little more comfortable with, and I just wound up here because I thought off race with a big that might be intriguing. Right. Uh, it's the next race at Golf Stream this afternoon. Optional claimer twenty five numbers or one other than seven and a half on the turf. You see. Now I will let you know going forward. I will be staying away from turf races that involve Chad Brown. Okay. I just think from betting standpoints and such, he's, he's the award-winning trainer. He has number one who I'm not even going to shot. I see this is a... Besant? I'll go Besant. Okay. Do you know is oh, okay. okay. Well, it's like a friend word for an Irish bet. So I, I'm... But it's a town runner who's making the start in September of 2015. Now, three to one on the morning line. We have obviously a lot of... And then you have your knee. Yeah, I, and... And no, I mean, it had to be a five and might be gone. Yeah. So I think this race set... I don't know if five, because I think the price questions... Content matter, I think after one is my open child. Yeah, I'm always audible. But yeah, I'm William Marcy Marcy will make his claim. But me, another one like ours, put one of them for a whole group out. The hard is to get nine for a lot of turf. Now, I think it's more turf. I just think I'm going out there all racing with the guy. The whole turn is not open there. I don't think I'm going that something went wrong. So I have an offspring of Scat Daddy in sharp hands, was in sharp hands before. But to me, to debut going nine furlongs on the turf and run well on this turf. This turf course makes Conquest Sandman with Luis Saez in the saddle. They are reporting first time gelding. This horse hasn't run in a couple of months. That makes it believable for me. Comes off the November 4th race. So it's 6 1 2 5. And, and I have a 12 1 2 7. I'll, I'll add in, uh, I had Dick Powell on earlier, and this was one of the races he talked about. He likes the number four rep scallion. So three of us have three different horses right. at that time. It's that kind of race. But I think if you hit, you're going to get paid. Mine's 12 to 1 on the morning line. The knock for me, obviously, is the outside post position. But I yeah, think I saw there's some back like class and, and, and backs to turf. It, it, and it, uh, I could cry about it afterwards. It may just be a, a, a bad move going that far out. Yeah, at the seven and a half. But we're going to get paid for it if we're, if we're right. And again, there's some back class and getting back to turf off a uh, trying to claim a crown jewel on the main track last time. I think this horse is better than that. I did use the Chad Brown second and. Uh, uh, I have the same one, two underneath that, right. that you have. So again, I have a 12, one, two, and seven. And, and it just, like I say, I. Uh, I was shocked I, when I saw you picked the yeah. 12 going on my back. And, and uh, shocked at the race. Also, I mean, it's a tough race. I, I just didn't see anything else that was uh, as intriguing. And I thought it was a good way to maybe kick things off. If right. one of us hits it, uh, it'll look good. All right, uh, for plays of the day, uh, you're up first yes. with uh, Gulfstream Parks. Third race, a maiden claimer, 40 tags, uh, 40 to 50 right. tags, six furlongs the trip. I was surprised how few horses uh, entered here, but I, this, it, what, said, this is going to be the majority of the time my theme. It, it, there are times when I, I if you're going to get a price on top in a small field, a part wheel trifecta, 
can be effective. And I will say that if we got more uh, into this, I would put the two in the second spot. But I'm the two with the three, four, five with the all. I just want to talk about taking to church. Uh, Eric Yeo trains his horse. But what I thought was interesting is they list up to 12 workouts. The first workout listed of the 11 was at Saratoga 48 and 2 breezing. If that was the first career workout for this offspring of Bodie Meister as a two year old, wow. But then had a second workout, then was laid off August to November. So I've seen talent, I believe. I love Bodie Meister as a stallion. Take with Lane um, Luzzy in the saddle. I figure in this field, I am going to get a price with a Todd Fletcher and other uh, known guys. I, I'm taking, taking to the church, and with that in a short field, if I'm right, you know, you're going to get the $18, and I can actually get a trifecta in a short field at a good price. I'm going to do a little three-horse exact box uh, over at Tampa. Their uh, sixth race today, conditional claimer, a mile on the turf. I'm going to box up the two, eight, and the three. That's the way I like it, two, eight, three, and seven. If there's a scratch, move the seven into the mix. But I thought rock-solid golfer uh, and uh, uh, flower punch are kind of equal to me, uh, talent-wise and whatnot, but Big Little City, uh, the number three horse, at a six-to-one price on the morning line, moving back to the turf, maybe the one to add some value in here. So we'll see. Sixth race at Tampa, do a little three-horse exacta box, two, eight, and three, toss in the seven if there's a scratch. All right, we'll head to a break. When we come back, we'll make contact with Mike Welch from the uh, Daily Racing Forum down in, South, down in South Florida. We'll talk a little Eclipse Award, Sunshine Millions, and next week's Pegasus Cup, all of that right after this. Watch me. I got it. Hey, I got something that makes me want to shout. I got something that tells me what it's all about. I got a move that tells me what to do. If you don't, brother, and sisters, then you won't know what it's all about. Come on! I want sales reports on my desk by Monday. Whoops. My bad. Love racing? RTN brings you every live simulcast on your home television, plus live video streaming and race replays on your PC and mobile devices. To order, visit RTN.TV. RTN, a breed apart. Hey, race fans, head down to the all new Clubhouse Racebook and get in the game with live horse racing on more than 250 flat screen TVs, state-of-the-art wagering terminals, fantastic food and drinks, and amazing Vegas-style atmosphere with seating for nearly 900 of your closest friends. Conveniently located at 711 Central Avenue, right off exit 5 of I-90 in Albany, the Clubhouse Racebook is the better choice. And they're off. We are joined now by Mike Welch from the Daily Racing Forum. Coverage of uh, South Florida, great job down there. Uh, also looking at the workouts and whatnot. Speaking of that, Mike, uh, you guys do the workouts. Great job. Everybody up here is familiar with your workout reports at Saratoga. Similar product uh, uh, in Southern Florida, correct? Yes, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's just a little more difficult to cover everything here because there's five training yeah. centers. You know, at least down there we just got you know, the Saratoga, Oklahoma, so the two of us could cover it pretty well. But uh, I still think we do. You know, we got most of the horses at Palmetto's. We got the Todd Fletcher stuff covered at Palm Beach Downs and everything at Gulfstream Park. So uh, I think we've had a pretty good meet so far. All right, let's uh, turn to some of the topics in Southern Florida uh, within recent days and uh, looking out to next week. Eclipse Awards last night, uh, we talked about it earlier, kind of chalked out. Did anything stand out to you? No, there were no real surprises at all, actually. Um, the only thing I was surprised about, a couple of the categories I thought might be a little closer than they were when I saw the 
final vote tallies. But um, now, nah, like you said, this year was uh, pretty predictable. Yeah, and, and California Chrome, Horse of the Year. We'll talk about him in a few minutes. You've seen him out on the track. But speaking of the track, before we get to the Pegasus, let's just look talk about a couple from yesterday. I pulled up a couple of highlights on that Sunshine Millions card. Uh, first, the Sunshine Millions Classic. Just got to watch this because uh, a ding-dong battle down to the wire. I was kind of surprised the betting public went as heavily as they did for Awesome Slew. Seven to five on the morning line, went to three to five. Awesome Slew's going to be the number eight horse and wind up third in here. Nauset Beach at 34 to one, second longest price on the board, almost holds on, but it's High Riverside when the photo was developed. Uh, was in front by a nose as the second choice at three to one. This was a nice battle. Yeah, it was a good race. I mean, a way, good way to end the day. Um, you know, I, I think you could have the Castellano factor here. Uh, you see a lot of the horses he rides, they just get over bad. Um, you know, and then you can see why. I mean, he's been the leading rider here for, I don't know, five, six years running now. Uh, but, you know, that outside post going a mile and an eighth, I, I've talked about it many times. Even though it was only post eight, it was just enough to compromise and cost that horse the race. He got hung out wide every step of the way. Really had to work hard to finally uh, get his head in front around the eighth pole, but uh, it just took too much out of him. And uh, I keep reiterating that the post position draw for the Pegasus next yeah. Saturday is going to be huge, just huge. I mean, it's 12 horses in there. If any of the key contenders of the two specifically draw 10, 11, 12, even 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, it's going to compromise their chances a little bit. I mean, we all, you know, know that they're the two best in there, but... Um, you know, sometimes they're not best enough where if, if you get compromised, they're only pushed out wide, hung out wide. This isn't the kind of track, this main track, that you could sustain a run with a wide trip. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting, no question about it. Just one more uh, Sunshine Millions race I wanted to touch on, because this to me has some implications later in the year. I think in the sprint division, the Sunshine Millions sprint, I think early entry might be a player in that sprint division off of this race coming back from a very long layoff, hadn't been seen since February of last year, an early entry is going to be the number five horse here, beating the favorite Delta Blues Man. Delta Blues Man went off at eight to five, early entry uh, at four to one, but Kathleen O'Connell, great job getting this horse ready for the comeback. Yeah, I mean, that's the first thing you have to say, you got to salute Kathleen. Um, she flies under the radar quite a bit nationally, but uh, everybody down here knows how accomplished she is, so she did an excellent job. You know, if the sprint division of all the big races were run at Gulfstream Park the rest of the year, yeah. this loss would certainly be a big factor. I'm not so sure how much yeah. of his uh, good form now is because of all those races were at Gulfstream. He obviously lost it here at Gulfstream Park. You know, eventually he'll get tested outside of here, and we'll see how he, he goes from there. But, you know, a great performance yesterday. He beat a legitimate horse. It wasn't like this was a straight Florida-bred only kind of deal. I mean, Delta Blues was proven outside of Florida, so... Uh, you know, it was a great effort all around, and we'll just see what happens with this horse as we go further down the road. Yeah, four for four now on the Gulf Street Park main track. Uh, Mike Anthony Mormino here, obviously. Uh, uh, you know, the Pegasus is, you know, knocking on the door. You've had uh, California Chrome there for a couple days. Uh, Arrogate, uh, how do the two of them look? Well, Arrogate's in California. I've only oh. seen the taste of his work, but um, he looks terrific. I mean, he just looks as good to me. Again, watching him on TV, as he did in person right before he won the Breeders' Cup. I mean, he was the horse to me to beat in the Breeders' Cup, the way he was training uh, when I saw him in person. And he looks like he's just a shot right now. So, um, and California Chrome, aside from getting a little hot here in the morning since he's been here, um, I thought he looked good. I mean, yesterday's work was what I was looking for. His first work here was just a maintenance work, uh, by, you know, a couple of days off the plane. But, right. uh, he looked good here yesterday. I thought um, he did everything that they they asked of him and everything they wanted from him. The track is a lightning fast, so uh, 59 and change, I think that's what he wanted, was pretty good time, and he did it super easy. So, you know, the two of them look like they couldn't be going into the race any better. It's the same way they went into their first match, so we'll see. Again, I think post position could be a big uh, factor, uh, potentially, uh, depending on where these two draw on Monday. I imagine if they drew 11 and 12. Yeah. <laughs> it would be, certainly make the race a lot more interesting. I know that. You know, I mean, for me, it's not a great betting race. you got a 6-5 right. and an even money or whatever. You know, if that were to happen, perhaps, you know, a guy might be inclined to take a little shot somewhere else. 
But uh, to me, it's a race to sit back, enjoy, watch, and uh, see which one of these is the better or see if, uh, if uh, Arrogate can indeed do it again or if, um, you know, Carl can turn the tables. It's I, the final race of his career, so it's something to look forward to. I agree, Mike, and, and I'm the type of person who loves betting horses, but I also think of horse racing the way my father's generation thought about baseball and a historic and a sporting event. For California Chrome's uh, standpoint, his final race, how much different will he be viewed 25 years from now, whether he wins or loses the Pegasus? I don't know. It, it, it remains to be seen what legacy the Pegasus will have five years from now, let alone okay. 25 <laughs> years from now. You know, I mean, maybe by that point it will be the most important race, you know, of the year, but right now it's just, uh, we'll see what happens with, with, with uh, Pegasus that goes on beyond this one year. They certainly got lucky getting these, getting these two. You know, I mean, certainly his career would punctuate an outstanding career. Money-wise, obviously, if he picks up another $7 million, <laughs> he's going to be tough to catch for a long, long time in that category. So from that standpoint, I think it, it, it could be significant. Um, but just... Uh, you know, all around his legacy, sure, you want to go out on a winning note and win a race like this, and you want to turn the tables on the one, you know, and, and erase the one blemish on your record from last year. So there's a lot, you know, at stake for him, I think, as far as that goes next Saturday. And let me ask your opinion, because Anthony and I were talking the other day. I think given that the, 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 the nice setup over the last month for California Chrome, he winds up the favorite, but Arrogate, Anthony's tilting in, in his favor. Who do you think is going to wind up to be the favorite? I think Crow will be the favorite, barring the fact that he might, if he were to draw, yeah, say, 11 post, and 12, yeah. and Arrogant were to draw inside, it might make a difference. I know the morning line is going to be slightly toward California's mm -hmm. Crow's favorite. I think he's got a bigger following, you know, yes. just as yeah. a popular thing. So I'm going to say, barring anything strange happening at the post position draw, which is always possible, um, I think Crumb will be the slight favorite. And, and what else have you seen that's notable as far as the, the potential Pegasus field and working out in the morning? Well, we don't have too many of them working with us at Gullspeed. The only other one I've really, two I've seen on a regular basis are huge long shots. Prayer for relief, the nine-year-old who's trained well, but uh, certainly doesn't have a chance to win this race. And Aragon, who was not trained well, and certainly, as far as I'm concerned, probably shouldn't be in this race. Okay. Um, you know, I've watched some tapes of other horses training. It looks like Keen Ice and, and Neil Lithic are doing well up at the Palm Beach House for Todd Fletcher. Comet's Ghost worked this morning at, the, at Palm Meadows. I heard he trained well. Um, you know, but again, there hasn't been too much right in front of me to see there. And, you know, and frankly, I don't think I could see enough from anybody to, to change my mind <laughs> yeah. about the two horse race. Well, I, I want to, before we let you go, I want to touch on one other horse that I hear is going to be on the undercard because I, I followed your Twitter feed and you've made some nice comments about his workouts over the past couple of weeks. Talk a little bit about the comeback for Cherry Wine. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it, it, it's sort of a comeback. I mean, he, he did start come back at, uh, last year, late at the end of the year, and did not run really well. His last race at uh, Churchill was not very good. I think they've done some surgery since then. And he's looked terrific out on the track since uh, he's gotten down here with Dale Roman. Um, he's training as well as anybody I've seen. He's still eligible for two other than, believe it or not, after all this time. But um, I, I think he's going to wind up in the Poseidon. He is a backup in case something happens to prayer for relief. He, would, he could wind up in the Pegasus, but I don't believe that's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I think he's going to be a, a player in, in, the, uh, in the Poseidon. I, it looks like about a 7-8 or a speedo. Stanford's going to be the one to beat for sure, and I'm not so sure Cherry Wine can beat Stanford. Stanford likes this track, so does Cherry Wine, but Stanford's in good form right now, and he's trained terrific, too, from what I've seen in his work. So, uh, but to answer your question, Cherry Wine is doing great, I expect a big effort out of him next week. And, and speaking of your Twitter feed, just one last thing. I saw you tweeted out this morning about shippers from Kentucky and Louisiana. Does that rule out Gunrunner? You know, not entirely. Apparently, they will allow gun runner if he takes the two tests they are requiring, and that would be a swap test and a blood test. And uh, right now, his connections are blocking on taking the swap test because there is a greater chance of a false positive there, and a false positive of any kind, or positive of any kind, false or otherwise, would mean that uh, Dell, uh, Steve Askewson's entire bond would be quarantined. Oh, so that looks like they're not going to uh, that. take that chance. They have 
that, you know, their time frame's limited. That they haven't taken the, the test yet. You know, they have to get these results back before they draw the race tomorrow at 445. So my gut reaction is we will not see Gun Runner. Uh, there's a major change of heart and plans here uh, today. All right. Mike, uh, as always, appreciate the visit. You're taking time on a uh, busy morning. Uh, again, we'll recommend people to check out the workout reports and whatnot from uh, Mike and company down in South Florida. We'll talk again. Okay, no. Talk Enjoy to you, guys. Thanks a lot. Mike Welch, a daily again, does a great job Mike. down in uh, Southern Florida. Twitter feed, you can catch up on workout reports as well. And, yeah, he's been high on cherry wine in and two tweets. One thing I will say this, I, 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 I feel differently about the California Chrome part there. I think if he wins... He comes right underneath spectacular bid for the horses who didn't win the Triple Crown. If he loses, he tumbles mightily to arrogate. I honestly believe that. I think there is a lot from a historical standpoint for him <clears throat> going forward because his resume will basically read that he lost the Triple Crown, had his foot torn off, and Seth got home four hours later, uh, eight hours later. And... Uh, he lost a shared belief. That will basically be his resume. But if he loses again to Arrogate, I, I think he, he takes a big tumble here. But uh, California Chrome, he will be the favorite. He, I mean, he has a fan base. There aren't many horses that have fan bases in this day and age, but he is one of them. He is one of them. I think Arrogate's fan base is, is us, is the hardcore day-in and day-out yeah, racing and people. developing. Right. We're like, we recognize that that Travers was a race for the ages and the then Kentucky he came Derby back winner beat. always pulls in a crowd yeah. and he's been around long enough now it's right. time, the Dubai World time Cup to develop. Center. So it's like and I do think Mike's right. They're gonna bet him, they're gonna make him the favorite just as they did out in California. I'll be happy to take the second choice in the wager. All right, why don't we head to our uh, next break? When we come back we will continue. More in they're off right after this. Stay tuned. Face it. Most horse racing websites are just too much, too much clutter, too much to navigate through. Next time, log on to CapitalOTB.com. Our newly designed website is easier than ever to use with all the information the professional horse player needs. CapitalOTB.com. Championship horse racing continues at Capital OTB. There's no better place to watch, wager, and win than OTB TV and CapitalOTBBet.com. January 28th at Gulfstream Park, an icon takes flight. The world's richest thoroughbred horse race. 12 of the sport's finest horses. One race. $12 million on the line. Watch, wager, witness. Go to PegasusWorldCup.com for more. Want more rewards? How about this? During the month of January, all Capital Bets account holders earn an additional 2% cash back on combined wagers of $250 or more when wagering on Aqueduct or Gulfstream Park. Not a Capital Bets account holder? Now's your chance to join and earn an additional 2% cash back on combined exotic wagers. Plus, when you join, wager $50 and Capital OTB will deposit $50 in your account. That's $50 free. No points, no gift cards, actual cash from Capital OTB. Jack Angelucci on the outside, Ali Chiba. Ferdinand has the lead. Ali Chiba, a final surge. The two Derby winners hit the wire together. Ferdinand and Ali Chiba in a dramatic photo finish. Welcome back to In There Off. Seth Merrill and Anthony Mormino in here. Kentucky Derby uh, contenders. We'll take a look at those. And every week also wanted to pull up. Uh, some races and maybe so horses. Quick, they went fast. They, would, they blew out our <laughs> Kentucky Derby they would, guys. They went right for the DQ <laughs> and the pick six. Uh, but uh, um, there was another race, and I talked about it on, on the handicappers report that I could, could have pulled off, and that was uh, from Monday, Dabster. I think Dabster yeah. for uh, Baffert, Baffert might be interesting. If you want, go back and look at that, because he, he got flattered yesterday by the uh, winner of the, uh, the California winners. Derby. That's yeah, a Baffert horse. So <laughs> the irrigate angle. It won't surprise me down at Oaklawn uh, 
for a, one of their stakes oh. down there. But uh, instead, pulled up a, a couple of races from yesterday that I thought were interesting. First up, we'll look at the stretch run to the Pasco. And uh, I thought the Money Monster uh, was worth taking a look at because this is only the second career start. The Money Monster in here is going to be the number three horse. Gets it done by half a length. Uh, as the seven to two second choice in here, the favorite at seven to five, number seven, chance of luck uh, coming out of a win in the inaugural at Tampa last time. So this is a pretty good win over a horse who had already been stakes proven. Uh, chance of luck out of the Gerald Bennett barn as well. So potent connections, but uh, the Money Monster career debut, November Gulfstream Park West, nice win there with a decent buyer number. Then it follows it up with the win yesterday. So now two for two, you know, obviously, Distance is going to be the question mark, but I think the Money Monster intriguing going forward. You know, what was funny was watching the, the racing and our young friend on the thing. This horse was getting bet and was getting favored off of the 7-2, to two and he wasn't off the 4-1 to one morning line, and he wasn't really talking about this horse, and I was thinking, you know, if he has a producer in his ear, yell, they're betting this horse was 6-5, to five, I think, at uh, one well, point. Well, that's the replay I showed when I talked to him on Friday, so he should have been quoted. Okay, so then... <laughs> Uh, and I will say this about the Pascal. We saw the stretch run, and I love this, even amongst the trees at Tampa Bay, Seth. I love this. I wish we're going to talk about a lot, many things this thing, but the, the split screen of the head on and the pan for sp particularly sprint races coming out of the trees at seven furlongs, and then they drop the head on. You'll watch it uh, two steps before, took four steps to the left, and wiped out the field right from the gate. Not a word was spoken. Yeah, uh, and, and again, I've mentioned it before. You mentioned it before. The, the gate, it's just an American racing. It's not But something. we should say this. In our Ooh. lifetime, it's transformed. We grew up in an era that wasn't okay. And the race I always bring up and everybody else brings it up is Sky Beauty's Grade 1 Spin Away 1992. It actually was a double DQ. Would not have happened 10 years later. Yeah, and occasionally, you, you talk about a stakes rate, and we're all kind of clued in, but occasionally it's just an everyday race that Absolutely. you may be watching nobody else is paying attention oh, to. Oh, they're you'll, all the you'll same see to the, me. You'll see the... Uh, the head on the gate and think, oh, wow. I mean, sometimes it's just, man, a horse will wipe, completely wipe out three well, horses. Well, that was the past. And I tell you, kudos to Richard Miglior. I say it all the time. The start is far more important yeah. than the finish. Far more. I mean, it's not even close. Well, you know, that's another good point. We're, we're talking about Thank the you. starting gate as opposed to the finish. But they don't even call them uh, really on the backstretch, on the clubhouse turn. It, it really... No. Fouls these days are the Egregious. last eighth of a mile. Yeah. All right, let's uh, move on to another race that I thought may be intriguing going forward with a three-year-old. Went, went to Laurel yesterday. They had a nice stakes card, but earlier on the card, uh, made in special weight for seven furlongs. And Linda Rice brought, brought a first-time starter into town by Tiz Wonderful. This is a horse called Tiz He, the one. Will be the number four horse. Went off as the four-to-one, what, third choice in here. Beating the even-money favorite, Dancing with Maud. And Dancing with Maud uh, was already stakes placed. Had finished uh, second in the Maryland Millions Nursery back in October. So again, given the competition in here, I think this is a pretty good performance from a debut runner from Linda Rice. Keep your eyes on T Tis He the One here winning, and uh, we'll see what this one does moving forward. Two things. Uh, at Offspring, it is wonderful. Uh, I love horses at Saratoga late in the year when they uh, win going seven furlongs. Uh, in scheduled the day races day now, it's, it's so hard to do. Uh, that was, that is typically the winning type move. I'm sure Dave Rodman would confirm that. You see horses win in that style and uh, big run out in that race. But boy, to debut going 7 ace to beat a horse who's the even money favorite, has four Stakes races placed. under the belt. That's pretty yeah. good. No, absolutely. Day. Kudos to them. All right, uh, we have some quick hitters as we uh, head to the uh, finish line here on And They're Off, edition one. I wanted to go back to Monday because, man, they, they hit that rainbow six with regularity down there. But, but you talk about it's a DQ. a lot of steam out. You, you talk about a DQ playing in your oh. favor. Uh, this, this guy must have been over the moon. We're going to watch the stretch run here of uh, Monday's finale. The number three horse, Tale of Priscelli, is going to come under the wire first but be DQ. Not so fast. But not only DQ'd out of the first place, he moves down to fifth. Well, which winds up me making a lone winning ticket in the Rainbow Six. So it, it, you're, you're getting the benefit of the DQ, and it wasn't even your horse that got bothered. You see the seven well, really get bothered there. Right. See, the eight gets moved up, and somebody collects $72,000 on the Rainbow and Six I will say this, on that, pick, on that you, DQ. You, after you sign for the ticket, you basically disavow 
talking about your bad beats the rest of your <laughs> horse playing life. You do not get to bring yeah, up you hope the bad beats. Yeah, you hope the 50-50 right. before you throw your life <laughs> I call this the aptitude angle, Seth. You might not remember a couple of years ago, aptitude was put up in a grade one million dollar race out in California when he was the benefactor of being the runner-up and the not interfered with horse uh, scores the victory. But I showed on Saturday's program, Seth, I don't know if you see the racing on Friday. They got to the last uh, leg of the pick six. The inside and the outside horse, the two and the 11, had one ticket for 306. They run second and third, and, and the guy loses by five, six feet from, from you know, a, a, a decade-changing score. Let's yeah. get to the derby, right? All right. Uh, no, we have uh, uh, the uh, Albatroni tweet. Um, oh, we skip a roll. By the way, I noticed my tweet of the week didn't make it. Dave Grenning and I both almost simultaneously put out on Friday. Five horse field comes in one, two, three, four, five. Oh, there you go. There you <laughs> go. Uh, and, and you're right. We did skip over the derby. A lot uh, that, of that, we that was my over. Cause we, cause You didn't even tell me we were doing sports here. I got the Packers and the we, Falcons. Uh, we, you like? Well, no, let's go back to the derby <laughs> because we, see, we, had, we do have a couple of minutes. We started late. Um, so let's get in those derby top five. Do you want to roll over your, yours first? I hope they put them up. So looking at Lee, to me, is the I I intriguing horse. McCracken is number one. And this is the new era, folks. Two races, you go to the Kentucky Derby, guess what you have, McCracken? Uh, I think he's on a lot, many people's uh, top. What do you have, him second? Yeah, I got okay. him right underneath. I put Classic Empire on top. Right. Just, just and he's because, the champion. Yeah. My and, horse, and experience over the Churchill downstrip, as right. does McCracken. McCracken. They, they, that's an edge for them going forward. The horse that I liked, if they roll into number three, is looking at Lee, because I was looking at it for somebody, not the masters of the obvious, and I liked how lo I very much liked how looking at Lee ran against the track of the Breeders' Cup out at Santa Anita going forward. I thought he ran well at a racetrack he couldn't win. Um, obviously, Dale Roman's runner-up, who was it? Uh, not at this time. Or yeah, that not this was, time. Not this time. He's out, you know, retired, etc. So looking at Lee was my third horse in there. I have mastery. And I was thinking about this the other day, Seth, when I said, and I have to get over this as, as a pro at this, but... I might have been, as it might turn out, that I was on track when Mastery ran his worst race, when he won the Bob Hope. So I, I thought he looked nor average that day. I was a little underwhelmed by it, but he's on my list. But McCracken, number one. But looking at Lee, who's working out, so I'm happy. And, and you've got looking at Lee, the, my yeah. uh, lone difference between the two. I have a well, classic, classic Empire, uh, McCracken, Mastery, Gunnavera, and Gormley. Right. So Gunnavera, I thought that Delta Mile was a pretty good-looking right. performance. Uh, from Gunavera, so I stuck that one uh, in as well. So uh, there you see my top five. These boards are awfully the, uh, sharp. The yeah, There's absolutely. A crack staff. Absolutely. That's very good. Looking. All right, now we will get to. Uh, wanted to pull up. Th this is uh, from a tweet uh, Steve Bick sent out uh, uh, earlier this week. It's a photo. <laughs> it's it's a kind of a throwback photo. photo, and I guess Tom Albertani. Throwback. It, <laughs> Carter was president. <laughs> I guess. I guess Tom Albertrani is now on Twitter. That was the impetus for it. But, but in honor of that, Bick tossed out this photo from 1980 at Aqueduct, a, a win photo down at Aqueduct, and Tom Albertrani jockey on the winning horse. Doesn't but, even look up. Now, I got a question. Do we have the picture for these guys? Is that Siaka on the right? I was going to say. It's got to be Gary be, Siaka. Behind the horse, if people look on the right side of the picture, it is a very youthful Gary Siaka as well, and that attracted. And I tell you one thing: I've known Gary for a long time. He probably loved that, that but I, oh, we don't have it. Oh, that's too bad. Maybe we, it, it's a great photo. I was like, I mean, I was, I wasn't quite there. There it go. is. Look at Gary Siaka on the right, folks. I can't. <laughs> that, he's got to. He's got to be eighteen. Absolutely, because we're about the same age, and that's nineteen eighty. Now, I, I made him immediately. I did not make Tom Albatroni. Yeah, the, the, I didn't. The <laughs> nose, maybe, but nothing else. Yeah, but I knew talking, that was Gary Siaka on the hind in a millisecond. Yeah, we're talking 37 Six years, years yeah. ago. Yeah. So, but what also stuck out to me, and just keep the pictures up for a second, guys. It's the, the aqueduct, backdrop. The aqueduct. Oh. The backdrop. <laughs> the aqueduct winner's circle, which now isn't much. But, but back in those days, you got the air conditioner coming out of the wall, <laughs> and the length of backyard fence that they put, pulled out, uh, you know, went out to Home Depot and <laughs> bought. It's like, what did they think? Oh, we'll make it a little more bucolic looking with the, oh, with the 
fencing. That is rough. Yeah. <laughs> so, that is rough. Yeah. But Gary Siaka, boy. Yeah. And uh, again, I thought that was kind of funny from uh, this week on Twitter. And just before we go, a little bit off topic, but uh, NFL playoffs today. Uh, playoff picks for you? Uh, it's a hurdle for them, but uh, I like the Falcons, uh, and I, I do like the Patriots uh, in there. I know that uh, nationally they'll be rooting for the Packers and the Patriots, and Aaron Rodgers on a roll, but I, I'm, Matt Ryan has to get over the hump. It's just like horses. You have a day, you have a defining day, and you have to take that next step, and Matt Ryan is, is there today. He has to beat Aaron Rodgers. I got to admit, uh, when it gets beyond college basketball and horse racing, I'm out of my element. Unless the Jets are having a decent season. And they're season. out of their element. Yeah, and, and so it's like two weeks into the season, I kind of checked out. <laughs> Pro basketball. How's that college basketball doing for yeah, you? Yeah, and you that, that's, out of there? that is rough. Well, it's so, uh, some days it's fabulous, and other days uh, I want to shoot myself. But <laughs> yeah, as a Syracuse fan, it's been like. I can't uh, carry the hour. Don't shoot a, yourself. Been a uh, rough uh, ride. But uh, up as a. Uh, Former high school quarterback, though, Brady. I'm not a Brady fan or a New England fan, no, but I think, I think Brady and Aaron Rodgers, and right. I think that sets up for a good uh, it would. Super Bowl. It would. I, I, I'll tell you the truth. It would, it would be a better Super Bowl than the team I like today. I know that's odd thinking, but it would, I think it would be a better Super Bowl. All right, let's roll through, through some promos and events here at Capital OTB coming up uh, here throughout the uh, end of the month and next week. Uh, Bet 50, get 50 goes through the end of the month. Put $50 into a brand-new account. Get $50 into your account from Capital OTB. Also, don't forget to uh, download the mobile app on your mobile device. Go to iTunes or Google Play. You can watch all the morning programming now through the mobile app as well. Also coming up, we have, I believe, 2% cash bonus is next, and yes, it is. Uh, every Wednesday and Thursday here at Capital OTB. Uh, through the end of the month, Wednesdays and Thursdays, bet 250 or more on Aqueduct and or Gulfstream. Get 2% on top of your regular rebate. Also coming up is uh, today, the last NFL Sunday, with those playoff games. Come on down, watch uh, the playoff action, and enjoy all the racing action as well. Next week, on uh, single uh, ticket bounty day on the 20th. Oh, wait, that's already gone by. <laughs> and it's kicked up. Uh, the pro the, the in inner, Can I play uh, it now? It's uh, 1250 now. Uh, so, uh, I think somebody puts up, up some consolation money. Uh, Wednesday, the pick four contest online with Brian Addo. Go to CapitalOTB.com for more information. And Friday, you're Friday, back in. It's the, pr the pressure is on you with me whiffing Get after, back, after back a, a big, big fall season where we were all kind of knocking out this of the This is park. such a different feel for me. Like, it, I was thinking it's been about 16 years since I did the second show. Uh, How did it work out for you? Well, there's no hard clothes. Oh, well. Yeah. It's a walk in the park. <laughs> all right, we will wrap things up. First edition of And They're Off. Hopefully you enjoy, enjoyed it. I know I did. And, a lot uh, of fun. Fast-paced. Uh, a lot of news, comments, opinions, handicapping. We'll see how the handicapping works out. We'll keep you up to date on that next week as well. Enjoy the racing this afternoon. We're going to wrap things up for this edition of uh, uh, And They're Off. And uh, Anthony All these Morpino. shows running through your brain. <laughs> Mero, we'll see you next week. You're watching OTB TV a service of Capital Off-Track Betting.